welcome to the keynote podcast from Kingdom Faith. Today's message is by Pastor Colin Urquhart. Who do you obey? Paul, when he's writing to the Romans, says, you serve the one who you obey. So, <clears throat> it's important to know who we obey. Now, the one we obey is the one who determines our decisions and therefore our actions. So there are many possibilities before us. We can obey our own emotions, our own feelings. We can obey our own reason, even our own determination because there's something that we want to happen, so we, we go with that. We obey our own understanding and our own reasoning. We can obey the influence of others who say, this is what you should do, or this is how you should go about things. Or this is the kind of strategy, vision, or whatever you should have at this time. Whether we get that through books off the internet or any other way, we can actually be following men rather than God. They might be godly men, but we're still following men and not God. Uh, we can obey the devil who is always wanting to undermine faith, accuse, bring condemnation, false condemnation. If we believe what he says, that's going to influence our actions, decisions, Possible, of course, to obey a whole number of these things because a lot of them interact and have impact upon one another. The alternative, of course, is to obey the Lord. But then what does that mean? We can seek to obey the word legalistically, as some Christians do. We can seek to obey the Spirit, but in the process get off into all kinds of wild and strange things like others sometimes do. We can obey the Spirit and the Word working together, which means that we're going to need the Holy Spirit to bring revelation of the Word to us and also that there will need to be a dependence in our lives upon the Spirit to enable the outworking of that revelation that he brings. That obviously is the right answer. But all these other things are going on all the time, not only around us in the world, but even in churches. So it's always a very sort of complicated 
confusing scene. Because the problem is that you can obey any one of those things and say you're obeying the Lord or think that you're obeying the Lord. Imagine that what you're doing is right. So um, <clears throat> it's no wonder that the scripture warns us so much about deception. Of course, we have the scriptures to keep us on course in the sense that, not that we try to legalistically in our own strength do what the scriptures say, but to know whether really what we're hearing, what we're receiving is truly from God. The question always comes back to what is the source of the, in quotes, revelation that we're receiving? Does it come from man? Does it come from man's wisdom? Does it come from reason? Does it come from what's happening in other places? Does it come from some deceiving spirit? Does it come really from the Lord into our present situation? This is a question we can never get away from. Now, we would not be surprised at uh, the world making decisions that are contrary to the will and the purpose of God. That's, that uh, is inevitable because you can't make spiritual decisions unless you're a spiritual person. The scripture is clear about that. You can't even have spiritual understanding unless you're a person of the spirit. So we, we would expect people in the world to make decisions on their own. Well, out of any of those things we've just mentioned, their own reason, their own understanding, deception, whatever. But what matters to the Lord that we as disciples, we as his children, we are making the decisions in our lives on the right basis. Let's turn to the first chapter of 1 Corinthians. We were talking on Sunday about Jesus being Lord, and he is. I thought I'd slip that in just to see if anyone was listening. <laughs> One person was. Uh, and he is Lord. Amen. Amen. <laughs> now, if he is Lord, things never ever get out of his control. doesn't matter what's happening where, God will still bring to fulfillment his plans and purposes, and nothing in the whole of creation can prevent that. So we need to be aware of that. Here in uh, 1 Corinthians 1, we'll start to read from verse 28. He chose those whom the re world regards as worthless and useless of absolutely no account to show the futility of human wisdom so that no one will be able to boast before God because of his intellectual ability or human strength. It is only through God's own work of grace that you now live in Christ Jesus at one with him. Jesus himself has become for us who believe the true wisdom that God has supplied. He is our righteousness, he is our holiness, he is our redemption, the one who has made it possible for us to be God's children. This is why it is written, 
that if anyone wants to boast, let him boast about what the Lord has done. What we can never get away from is our own weakness. Now, you see, the enemy wants to try to trade on that and to make us feel failures because of our weakness. But as you've heard me say on a number of occasions, like Paul, we need to understand that our weakness is our strength. When I am weak, then I am strong, he says. Why? Because when you recognize your weakness, that throws you into a position of being dependent upon the Lord. You know that there's no point in trusting in yourself, therefore you have to trust in him. And you see, all of God's purposes, not man's purposes, but all of God's purposes can only be fulfilled through trust in him. So there is a sense, you see, in which in the wisdom of God, he chose those who are weak enough to know that they have to put their trust in him. And even if people are very clever, even if, if they are very able, like Saul of Tarsus, for example, he has to reduce them to a point of weakness in order for them then to be prepared to trust in him. So this very proud and able and self-righteous man was made blind by the Lord God Almighty, not by the devil, but he was blinded by a light that shone from heaven, not from hell, uh, in order to reduce Saul to nothing, really. Make him understand how completely blind he had been to the purposes of God. And that event turned his life around, and instead of being the strong, able, intellectual, the proud man, he became a humble servant, a slave of Christ, a slave of righteousness. It is of the nature of man to be proud. The, the, uh, the flesh is by nature proud. Now, pride can take two forms. There's the arrogance, where you think you're better than others, but there's the other kind of inverted pride where you think you're so weak and useless in yourself that all you do is think about yourself and talk about yourself and worry about yourself and get everybody all around you fed up about yourself. That is, <laughs> that is another form of pride because pride is essentially focusing on self. So whether you do that in an arrogant way or in, uh, uh, in a completely opposite way, it is still pride, it is still self-centeredness, it is still putting the emphasis uh, on yourself. Uh, that obviously is never the purpose of God. So in choosing weak people, he hasn't chosen those that are going to put the emphasis on themselves and on their weakness and walk about complaining about their weakness but boasting about their weakness, as Paul says, in the sense that then I can put my trust in the Lord and I can be strong spiritually. Uh, the important thing is that in our weakness we do depend upon him and not upon any of those other pressures or influences or people no matter how good they may appear to be, that are around us. You see, under the new covenant, one of the promises that God made is they will all know me, in the sense that everyone will be able to have personal relationship with me. Everybody will be able to receive revelation of the truth by the power of the Spirit, so you can walk in the Spirit, in dependence upon the Spirit, in obedience to the Spirit, knowing that the Spirit always directs you to Jesus, knowing that the Spirit will therefore encourage you to see the outworking of his word in your life. Now, of course, if... Um, if we're going to be dependent upon the Word and, and, and Spirit in that way, we are in need of revelation all the time. 
And God is aware of that. But what is revelation? Revelation is simply hearing God. And as God speaks to us every day, we do need to make sure that what we're hearing is God. We're not listening to ourselves, we're not listening to others, we're not listening to other influences, um, certainly not evil influences, but even uh, other good rational in, um, influences that can take us away from walking in dependence upon God and therefore in fulfillment of the revelation that God is giving us. It's always interesting to me that the scripture says you do not know how to pray as you ought. Uh, that only the Holy Spirit can actually guide our prayer. And sometimes we think we know, well, this is what we ought to pray and this is what we ought to believe and this is what ought to happen because this is the purpose of God. And at, at one level that all sounds very, very good and very well and very right, but you can do that without actually listening to what the Spirit is saying. It's almost as if you are trying to say, look, Holy Spirit, this is what you must do in this situation. And uh, sometimes the, the Lord wants to stop us and say, why don't you listen to what the Spirit says is going to happen? Yeah. Not what you want to happen. Because then your, your prayer will be informed by the Spirit. Now, this is not always easy. Because we get passionate about things, which on the one hand is good, but on the other hand is dangerous. Because it's great if we're being passionate about what God is saying, but it's not so good if we're being passionate about something that he's not saying. Hello. Hello. But you see, underneath all this is this, this little word, obey. Who are we actually obeying? Are we obeying the Spirit? Are we obeying the Spirit <coughs> revealing the Word? Are we obeying the revelation that God is bringing and that God is giving? What we find in experience is that the only way to actually really know that and to be sure of that is to see what happens. Because whatever the Holy Spirit says is what will happen. Amen? Whatever God says is going to be, will be. Mm -hmm. Let me just give you a, <clears throat> a very simple illustration. None of us would want a war. But what happens if the Holy Spirit says to you, there's going to be a war? What do you do? Pray that there will not be a war? Now, it would be different if the Holy Spirit said, pray that there will not be a war. But if he says there's going to be a war, you can be absolutely sure there's going to be a war. Now, in a situation like that, you then have to say, Lord, how are we to pray? Mm -hmm. Everybody with me? Yes. Because we would need the wisdom of God. 
Mm -hmm. You see, sometimes the Holy Spirit reveals to us what is about to take place, not so that we can try to prevent what is about to take place, but so we can know how to pray and conduct ourselves in the light of what the Spirit of God is saying. That we, as his body, will be the faithful witnesses in the light of what he knows is about to take place. Now, because this is the case, the Lord is always one step ahead of everybody else. And if we're listening to his voice, we will always be one step ahead of everybody else. And we will always know how to pray because we're listening to the one who is always one step ahead. I mean, he's really several steps ahead. But you know, you know what I mean, that he is always ahead of the game because he always knows the end from the beginning. Yeah. Nothing ever surprises him. Nothing can happen without his knowledge. <coughs> Nothing can happen without his prior knowledge. Yeah. It isn't that he, he simply knows about it when it happens. He knows about it before it happens. Yeah. This is all this business about him living in eternity and not in the time realm. Now the importance of this is that if we're really sensitive to the voice of God, we don't get disappointed. Uh -huh. When things don't turn out in the way that we would like or even in the way we think God would like, we don't get disappointed because he knows And even when things don't go, you see, as we would want, that's not the end of the game. God is still in charge. God knows what he's going to do. God knows how he's going to work in the whole situation, not only in the church, but in the world. But what he requires is that his children, his faithful children, are faithful in their witness in what is happening. In the last few days, if uh, you've been following reports in the media, there have been a number of wonderful opportunities for Christians at a national level to be interviewed and giving their views about the matters that have been before Parliament. Wonderful opportunities. God has given great opportunity for witness to the truth. And it's been very good the way the believers have conducted themselves in those interviews, often in great contrast to those who oppose the truth. And there's a kind of a peace and a, um, a, a sort of a, a depth, really, uh, about those that are bearing witness for the truth. Will the truth prevail? Yes, in the end. But that doesn't always appear to be the case in the immediate situation. Mm -hmm. If things don't go the way we want, or even the way we prayed, is that because our prayer has failed? No. No, no, no. It's because God is in charge. And he says, yeah, I hear you, and yeah, yes, I, I know. I know what is righteous, I know what is unrighteous, I know what my will is, and I know what is against my will. I hear you. But actually, it's going to work out like this. Because I'm exposing the sins of mankind at this time. And what you have to understand that what is hidden in the heart is being shouted from the rooftops now. And of course, as is always the case, uh, men will reap what they sow. 
And from a biblical perspective, we can, we can be really concerned that decisions that are being made now are going to give birth to all kinds of problems in our society. The next generation is going to suffer as a result of the decisions made in this generation. But you try telling that to people now, unless they're already believers. They won't want to even hear you. But they will hear when they begin to see the evidence of that. Hello. Now that doesn't mean that we're silent about the truth, we keep speaking the truth because it's only as that truth is spoken that it will eventually prevail in the purposes of God. If you look at the book of Revelation, not now, but, you know, as your late night bedtime reading, you will see that things are going to get infinitely worse before Jesus comes again. The kind of situation we're concerned about now is sort of child's play by comparison with what is going to happen. And there is a sense in which all this is part of, of the end time. You see, what God is going to do is initiate a new heaven and a new earth. He is not going to reform this earth he is going to demonstrate that this earth is totally unreformable. Just like he can't reform the flesh, he had to make us new. So he's going to demonstrate the earth is so corrupt and man is so full of corruption, so full of his own ways, that the only godly, righteous, just answer is to create a new earth. And those who will be part of that new earth will be those who have consistently been faithful in their witness in the earth that is so full of man's corruption, injustice, and unrighteousness. Things are going to get progressively more difficult for Christians, therefore, to bear witness within the context of what is happening in the world if you read the book of Revelation and believe it. No matter how you interpret it, whether very literally or figuratively, it all comes back to the same thing, that God knows what he is going to have to work out in creation. Now, we know that before Jesus comes again, there's going to be a, a mighty move of the Spirit among the Jewish nation. You look at the Jewish nation now, and you would say, well, <laughs> there's very little evidence of that, except that more Jewish people are being saved now than were 10 years ago, but nothing like the kind of scale that we would think the scriptures were referring to before Jesus comes again. So that's sort of held out as a promise, as, as a hope for the future. Well, this is what is going to happen, and when it happens, you know the time for Jesus' second coming is going to be very imminent. You know, people are forever saying, oh, it's about to happen, it's about to happen. They've been saying that for hundreds of years. Um, but actually, if you read the signs of the times, one of those signs will be that there will be this explosion of faith uh, within Israel among God's Jewish people. So <clears throat> that's not happening yet. Of course, God can intervene at any time and cause that to happen. But all over the world, there is corruption, 
there is warfare, there is conflict, there are innumerable things going on. Apparently there are over a hundred wars and conflicts going on in the world today, even as I speak. There is so much happening in the world that is not the will of God that a vote in Parliament is small fry compared with all that. And yet, God knows. God knows. And this is where you see, you keep your eyes on the Lord and not on events because you don't get your revelation or your understanding of the truth from what is happening but only from the revelation that comes from the Lord himself through his word and by his spirit. So God has chosen not people of great stature, status, but just weak, foolish people that would depend upon him and be his faithful witnesses, keep plugging away at the truth, irrespective of what happens, in the world, irrespective of how many setbacks, rejoicing when there seems to be a breakthrough, praising God when there isn't. Hello? Because he is the same and God is working his purpose out. Understanding that he, he is the only righteous one. He, he is the only holy one. That all righteousness, all justice, all truth All holiness is to be found in God and in God alone. That all wisdom is in him. He is our wisdom. Now, if we go on reading in 1 Corinthians, uh, in verse, let's pick it up at verse 6. However, it is true to say that our message, our message, not the world's, but our message, because it's based upon the revelation of the truth, our message is one of wisdom, as the mature among you realize. But I do not mean the wisdom of contemporary natural thinkers, nor what passes as wisdom by those who rule over us, a wisdom that is futile before God. See, what's happening now is nothing new. All these things are happening at the time of Paul and have happened ever since. No, we speak the wisdom that comes from God, a secret wisdom that has been hidden since before time began, but has now been revealed by God to enable us to know his glory and even to be partakers of the glory ourselves. None of the present political rulers understand this wisdom. If they had, they certainly would not have crucified Christ, the Lord of glory. However, it has been written, nobody has seen, nor heard, nor understood what God has prepared for those who love him. Yet God has now revealed this to us by his Spirit. Only the Spirit is able to understand all things, including the deep things about God. Nobody can know the thoughts of another person, but each knows his or her own thoughts. Similarly, nobody knows God's thoughts except his own Spirit. And we who believe in Jesus have not been given the Spirit of this world, but God's own Spirit, whom he sent to us so that we can understand all that he has given us. So we do not speak in words of worldly wisdom, but the Spirit gives us the words to speak, and he enables us to express spiritual truths in spiritual words. Someone who does not have the Spirit does not believe the truths that come from God's Spirit. They seem foolish to him, and he does not understand because these truths only make sense to those who possess God's Spirit. 
The man who has been blessed by receiving the Spirit is able to make correct judgments about everything. He can discern what is right or wrong. And no one can judge him for the wisdom given him by God. For who can outthink God or instruct him? However, we have been given the mind of Christ, so we know how he views things. It's all pretty clear, isn't it, really? You can't expect of the world what you can only expect of those with spiritual discernment because they possess the Spirit, because they're alive in the Spirit. Mm Mm-hmm. It's been great that men of God have stood up in Parliament and have declared what they believe. That's being the faithful witness in the present situation. But believers are vastly outnumbered by those with worldly thinking who do not understand the things of the Spirit, who do not even care about the will and purpose of God if they believe there is a God who has a purpose. We need to say no more. (laughs) But what I believe God, you see, is saying to us this morning is in a sense, never mind all that. Never mind all the wars and strife that is going on in the world. all the corruption, all the abuse. I mean, our papers are full one day after another of one tragic situation after another, where it's corruption of young children, whether this morning I heard on the news that there are two murders a week in this country through marital violence. Two deaths a week. That's a hundred over a hundred a year. So we get here of some of them, but there must be a whole lot more than we never even get here of. All kinds of social problems out there, because the world is the world. But our God sent his son to establish the kingdom of God in the world. But the, uh, but the kingdoms of this world will not become the kingdom of God until Jesus comes again. Yeah. Yeah. So don't be fooled into thinking suddenly this nation is going to be transformed to become like the kingdom of God. That will only happen in the new heaven and the new earth. Yeah. Interesting to me that there's going to be a new heaven to go with the new earth. But that's another matter. We won't get into that this morning. But the, <clears throat> so what is God saying to us? He said, look, never mind all that. All that is the mess that I came to redeem. And, and you see, God sends his witnesses into all of those areas. When I say, you know, never mind, I don't mean disregard it. I mean, but don't, don't think that because all that is happening, God has lost control of the situation. He knows precisely what is happening. He knows exactly what he's going to do about it. He knows exactly how he's going to raise up the people that he needs in every one of those situations to actually be his witnesses. But you see, for some, in some of those situations, to be his witness means that today they will be martyred. And God knows that. And God will allow that to happen. Because to be his witness in a situation sometimes means that either you become a martyr or you deny Christ. And that's not a biblical option. So these things are going on all the time out there. 
And God knows where every one of his children, where every one of his witnesses is, and God knows what he's requiring of every one. So what's God's word to us? You better obey what I am saying yourself. The world will be full of corruption. Yes, get out there and save people from the corruption. Yes, pray for the be social justice and all the rest. But what matters to me, this is the Lord, I believe, saying to us, what matters to me more than anything else is your faithful obedience to me of what I'm asking of you. Because, you see, that is the only way that his purpose will ever get fulfilled. That is the only way that his plan will actually be fulfilled. By those that he places in all these various situations, or he gives them a compassion and concern for people that are involved in all those evil situations. His plan and purpose is dependent upon their faithful, loving obedience to what he's saying. Now, beloved, a person does not suddenly become obedient. A disobedient person doesn't suddenly become obedient. You see, what God does in his mentoring of our lives, what God does is he continues the discipleship to make us disciples, is he's teaching us to obey him out of loving obedience to him. Are we there? So it matters to God today that whatever he asks of you today, you obey him. Out of love for him. It doesn't matter how small the thing is because in that obedience you're proving faithful in little things. And none of us knows the obedience that God is going to ask of us in the future. Which might be a very much more demanding obedience than the little things he puts before us now. But you see, the only way for God's plans and purposes to be fulfilled is by him raising up a people who are obedient to those plans. Now, what he says and what he promises in the world, look, to do that in the world, you're going to be persecuted, you're going to be hated, you're going to be abused, some of you are going to lose your lives, you're going to be in prison, all kinds of things are going to happen to you. I promise you that because they'll treat you just like they treated me. But that's the cost of living the kingdom in the world. So actually, we're coasting at present in the sense that, you know, we're doing pretty well, really. I mean, whether you're aware, allowed to wear a cross to work or not, come on, let's get real, shall we? We've got a few more contentious things like, than that to fight for. It seems, doesn't it, that in our society at present, Christians are getting a raw deal. Hallelujah. We must be doing something right because Jesus got the rawest deal of all and he is the truth. We're not fighting for Christians to have a good deal in our society. We're contending for the kingdom of God that the kingdom will come and the will of God will be done on earth as in heaven. We're contending to save out of the darkness and the corruption and the evil 
and all the deception, those who will embrace the truth, who will then repent of all the stuff that they have believed and that they've been part of, and they will be made new, and they themselves will become witnesses. That's what we're contending for. Will it be an uphill struggle? Of course it will, but the victory is the Lord's. Will it be easy? No, nothing, nothing in the kingdom is easy. Right? It's the aggressive that take hold of it. Amen? You know, we somehow think, well, you know, we're believers, we're the children of God, we're the truth. Everything should be nice and easy for us. God should cause it all to fall into our laps and everybody will realize, you know, we're the nice people. We're the good people. We're on the side of God. Instead of which they hate us for it. But, I mean, that's par for the course. I mean, I, you know, I spend my life, the, 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 the thing that you find is that it's the Christians that hate you more than the people in the world yeah. once you start contending for God. Yeah. That's why so many of the churches, of the formal churches, are caving in to all these pressures. They're going along with it. They're saying, right, well, how can we adapt what we believe to fit in with the standards that the world are now appropriating and saying is right. I mean, that's turning the whole gospel on its head. A church in Scotland made a decision yesterday. They'd stood out against this for, for some years, but they'd made a decision yesterday that now they're allowed to appoint gay ministers for their churches. Just join, the, just join the crowd, Church of Scotland. Sort of attitude, well, you know, this is the way things are going. We, we want to appeal to the world, so we'll, we'll... It's sad, isn't it? So what God needs more than anything at this time is an obedient people. Yes, we will pray for righteousness. Yes, we will pray for godly government like the scripture tells us to do, so that the gospel may go on unimpeded. But praise God, at least we can preach the gospel now yeah. and nobody can stop us. Yeah. And even in countries like China, you see where they try to stop the preaching of the world, the church is expanding faster than anywhere else in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Because... The children of God there are just living in a totally different level from the, the, the level of society in which they live. And the same has to be true here in this country. Okay, you know, the nation has to go along with what these political leaders with no spiritual understanding decide. But that doesn't mean we allow that into the churches. But even if some allow that into the churches, there will always be God's faithful remnant that will hold to the truth, hold fast to the truth, will contend to the truth. So what's, what's God actually saying to us in the midst of all this this morning? He says, don't you dare, don't you dare judge anyone. All judgment belongs to the Son. Don't you dare take it upon yourself to judge anyone or anything that is happening. It's not your job to judge the politicians. It's not your job to judge those who are guilty of corruption. It's not your job to judge those that are guilty of violence. Your job is to extend to them the hand of mercy, the hand of God. But don't you dare judge them. 
And don't you dare judge one another. Because, you see, if there's judgment within the church, how can we save ourselves from judging what is going on outside the church? No, you see, what matters to God is that we are obedient to his word now in our lives, not in a self-righteous way, but recognizing we are so weak, Lord, there's no way in which we can actually fulfill your plan out there in the world except by your spirit. Is it possible for God to change a society? Yes. Historically, it's happened for brief periods of time in limited areas. How does it happen? Only through revival a revival among God's people. There have been revivals that have stopped crime, emptied prisons, brought about righteousness, whole cities and areas impacted. It has happened. It can happen again. But it's not a question of saying, God, just turn up and do it. See, because as you've heard me say, God doesn't revive nations, he revives people. The nation can only be revived if people are being revived. So what's God saying to us about our nation, about the nations of Europe? There's more than one nation represented here, but basically they're all in the same, same boat. What is he really saying to us? Well, I call you as my church to be salt for the earth, light for the world. A city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. You know, the whole whole earth really is in darkness, but there's that city of light set up on a hill. What I've called you to be is leaven. But you see, I mean, I'm not an expert on baking, but I can remember when uh, my wife used to make bread every day when we were in community. You need the yeast, yes? yes. And you, could, you can get yeast in, in two forms. You can get it as a culture. You go to a baker and get a bit of yeast that's already alive, or you can get dried yeast which you then moisten and mix and it becomes alive and then you can use it. Something like that anyway. Sound right? Yeah, yeah good, okay. Uh, <clears throat> God has got yeast in this nation, but to a great extent it's dried yeast. Not the living culture that really will make a difference. And when you've got dried yeast, what, what you need is, is the living water of the Holy Spirit to bring that to life so it becomes the culture that will affect the culture. And that is doubly important and doubly difficult at present. Why? Because the world now has the impression 
that not even Christians agree as to what is right. Because there are so many church people. We, we would say, well, they're religious people, they're church people, they go to church, but they're not necessarily born again. They don't necessarily know the Lord. They're not necessarily people of the Spirit. But of course, that's not the perception of the world, is it? You see, to the world, to especially the political powers in the world, the church are the institutional churches. Not God's secret weapon that he's been preparing for these last few years and that is beginning to rise up now. Uh huh. But needs to rise up with greater strength and power and. Eh? But the difficulty is, you see, that not even, you know, there, there isn't a unified Christian witness. But God does have his faithful remnant. And what does that mean? It means, my dear friends, that we are faithful to God. That's what it means. That we can forget impacting society if we're not faithful to him in our own lives. Because that's where it has to start. How can we ask people in the world to obey God if we don't obey him ourselves? So I praise God. I give thanks in all circumstances. I thank the Lord for what is happening now with all my heart. I'm not at all in the least, to be honest with you, surprised. <laughs> I have been seeking to listen to what the Spirit has been saying in recent weeks. Not in the bit surprised. It doesn't mean that this present issue is over. Not by long. That there's, there's much to do. But, 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 I'm not at all dismayed. I'm not discouraged. Yeah. Not in the slightest. Because I know that nothing can change right. God. Yeah. Nothing can change his word. Yeah. Nothing can change the truth. Nothing can compromise those who faithfully believe the truth and who walk in the truth and will be faithful witnesses for the truth, that it doesn't matter what parliament decides, it doesn't matter what other governments around the world decide, nothing will touch our God, nothing can affect the kingdom of God. The church, yes, but as I was explaining to some of you students yesterday, the church and the kingdom are two completely distinct entities in, in the scriptures. And the church can, is full, can be full of corruption, spots, wrinkles, all kinds of things. But nothing, absolutely nothing, can affect the kingdom. Amen. Because the kingdom is where Jesus rules. And so where Jesus rules, there is righteousness. Where Jesus rules, there is holiness. Where Jesus rules, there is redemption. Where Jesus rules, there is victory. Where Jesus rules, there is the truth. Where Jesus rules, there is life. Where Jesus rules, there is love. So we've just simply, and mercy, and grace, and all the rest, so we've simply got to be sure that that kingdom rule is being expressed in our lives Amen. so that we can be leavened. And pray that where the yeast has got dry, the Holy Spirit will come, come with fresh power, fresh life, fresh touch from God to quicken that, that yeast so that it rises up. Before, I think this is probably being prophetic, before a lot of people, of Christians, if you like, that are in that category, will be stirred enough for God to do that in our lives, things might have to get a lot worse before they get better for more Christians just to realize how they have to be stirred up in their faith and not simply passive spectators of what is happening. <coughs> 
So there's been a bit of a different yeah. keynote. But we end, you see, where we began. Who are you obeying? Where are you getting your revelation? And when God speaks, are you doing it? Yeah. Amen? Come on, let's stand. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, Lord. Yes, 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 yes. Potaparia leto bakala sita. Come on, let's just praise the Lord. Praise Him. He is worthy. He is holy. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Purra la basata para la basito di satari elero bacala sito ba. Purra la basata pari eletu bacala sito di sanduma. Come on, Jesus. Come on, Jesus. Come on, Jesus. Purra la basata pari elero bacala sito di sanduma. Borra tapare elero bacara sitri sanda para sotoba. Borra la basatari elero bacara sitri sanduma. Wonderful, wonderful Lord. I praise you, I bless you, I exalt you. Glorify your name, Lord. Glorify your name. Borra la basatari elero bacara sitoba. Borra la basatari elero bacara sitri sanduma. Boza tapari elero bakara sitari sanduma. Yes, 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 yes. Lord, we thank you that when you sent your son, he was obedient to you. In every detail of his life, long before he went to the cross, in everything he was obedient to you. And Lord, he knew. We, we, we praise you for, you know, that he went, he went to the cross uh, through his obedience. But Lord, Jesus knew. Every day of his life, in every detail of his life, how important it was for him to obey you. Or there would be no cross. There would be no victory there would be no salvation. I thank you, Father, that he understood every day of his life how important it was for him to obey you in what you were putting before him. And even when he was assailed with every temptation, just as we are, he knew every day of his life how important it was to obey you so that he could be the sinless sacrifice for our sins. Lord, help us to have this understanding that even in the small things, even in the little things, even in the things you put before us today, it matters. It really matters that we, we obey you out of love, not out of legalism, not out of law, not out of, uh, of duty, but we obey you out of love. That today, we do what you ask of us today. That today, we say yes to your will. We say yes when your spirit speaks and reveals your purpose. We say yes as he declares your word to us. And gives us direction. Help us to understand, Lord, that saying yes even in these details, actually 
in a sense, has a knock-on effect that affects our, our witness in the nation. That if we can't obey you in our personal lives, how can we be salt and light and a city set on a hill? How can we be leaven if we're dried up yeast? So, Lord, we thank you for that fresh anointing of your Holy Spirit. We thank you for that fresh empowering. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are the spirit of wisdom and revelation. That you give us wisdom, you give us revelation. You become the voice of God in our conscience, in our hearts. That your spirit speaks through our spirit. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you give us the grace and the power and the enabling to, to put that word into practice. And Lord, if any of us in this room has compromised that obedience, I ask that, that there will be the repentance that is necessary and your forgiveness, Lord, your mercy. So we really will be an obedient people. Not just obedient individuals, but an obedient people. That will really make a difference in this town, in the 25 mile radius, in the nation and beyond. Lord, I thank you that we're dealing with spiritual realities this morning. Things that are not obvious to the world. Things that are not even obvious to many church people. But Lord, they are obvious in, in the Word of God. They are obvious to those with discernment. And your Word says, let the mature think like this. Let the mature see this. So we thank you, Lord, that we do not speak in words of worldly wisdom, but the Spirit gives us the words to speak, and He enables us to express spiritual truths in spiritual words. Someone who does not have the Spirit does not believe the truths that come from God's Spirit. They seem foolish to him, and he does not understand, because these truths only make sense to those who possess God's Spirit. But Lord, we thank you that the man who has been blessed by receiving the Spirit is able to make correct judgments about everything. Not to judge people, but to make correct judgments. And thank you, Lord, that you don't call us to judge the nation, to judge the politicians, to judge those in parliament, to judge those who oppose us, to judge those who speak ill of us, to judge those, Lord, that, that do not understand. Thank you that you alone are the judge, that all judgment belongs to you. I thank you that you will call them to account. You will deal with them, Lord, not us. But, Lord, we just want to make sure that our own house is in order so that you can use us in the most effective way possible. And we give you all the glory. We give you all the honor. We give you all the praise. We just humble ourselves this morning under your mighty hand. But, Lord, we do pray for our nation. And we do pray for the politicians. We pray for them, Lord, not against them. We pray for them. We pray, Lord, that, that they will receive spiritual wisdom and understanding. We pray, Lord, that one after another will have a spiritual breakthrough. We pray, Lord, that even, even yesterday, seeds of truth will have been sown by those who were witnessing to the truth. We pray, Lord, that your spirit will be moving in the hearts of many of those politicians, causing them to lose peace, to feel disturbed, to be concerned, even if they don't understand why or how that should be the case. But, Lord, we just pray that you will be working, that you will be operating in every single one of them. Come on, let's pray in the Spirit for them.
Poparazatari alero bakarazidri sandama. We ask, Lord, that your spirit be at work in all those who will be sitting in the House of Lords when this legislation comes before them in the coming days. <coughs> we thank you, Lord, that there will be further opportunities for the truth to be proclaimed. We thank you that there will be further opportunities for the, wor for the words of truth to be sown as seeds into the hearts of others. Oh, Lord, we bless you. We praise you. We thank you for these wonderful opportunities there are to proclaim the truth. We thank you for each one of those media interviews that have been a further proclamation of the truth. And, Lord, we believe that there will have been people all over the nation that will have identified with that. And, and somehow you would have been using every one of those as an opportunity to extend your kingdom. And we just give you the glory, we give you the honor, we give you the praise. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you know what you're doing. Thank you that you are in charge. Thank you that you could choose to intervene at any moment if that's what you wanted to do. If, if you knew that was the right thing to do. But, oh, Lord, we thank you that you <clears throat> are going to act according to your wisdom. You are going to act according to your plans and your purposes that you are working out in the whole of creation. <clears throat> and, Lord, we see what a terrible mess the world is in. But we thank you that you are the great Redeemer. We thank you, Lord, that there will be a new heaven and a new earth where your justice and your righteousness will prevail for all eternity. And we give you glory. We give you honor and praise. We thank you, Lord. We praise you, Jesus. Bless your wonderful, wonderful, wonderful name. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you are raising up witnesses in, in all the areas of our society where there's corruption, where there's abuse. Thank you that believers are getting in there. And seeing you touch lives, healing people, transforming them, redeeming and saving. We pray, Lord, for fresh oil, fresh anointing and blessing to be upon them. Fresh effectiveness and fruitfulness in their ministries. Thank you, Lord, for all those that are pouring out their lives for others. that there might be a mighty harvest for your kingdom. And thank you that everything will work out according to what you have revealed. It shall be as you have said, that once you have spoken, you will never revoke what you have said. So we thank you that heaven and earth will pass away, but your words will not pass away. Thank you that no matter what men decree, your word will never change. The truth will always be the truth. And we just give you glory, we give you honor, we give you praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. Praise your holy name. Puparazatari aledo bakala sitri sandama. O paparazatari aledo bakala sitri sandama. Oh, paparazatari alero bakarazitaba. Now, just before we finish, you see, if I'd gone on reading in 1 Corinthians, the next section says this, My brothers, I want to speak to you as spiritual people, but you're still so worldly in your thinking, like little babes in Christ. This is why I had to feed you with milk rather than the solid food for which you were not ready. And this is still the case. You are still worldly in your attitudes. This is proved by the fact that you are jealous of one another and quarrel among yourselves. 
This is to act as mere men, isn't it? And so on. You see, that is still the situation. I'm not just talking about here, but in the whole church worldwide. And then Paul goes on to talk about the divisions and following men. I follow this one. I follow that one. I'm reading this book. I'm going after this fashion. It, it's, it's all still happening. And what he's saying is, well, that's, that's like behaving like little babies, not as mature people. Hmm? But God has called us to be mature, hasn't he? That's got nothing to do with age. It's all got to do with dependence upon the Holy Spirit and upon the purposes of God. So we thank you, Lord, that we don't want worldly thinking. We say no to worldly thinking. And thank you that you are giving us that transformation of our minds, that renewing of our minds, so that we think kingdom. We think truth. And therefore we speak kingdom. And we speak truth. And we act kingdom. And we act the truth. So we praise your wonderful name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you for listening to this Kingdom Faith podcast. We trust it's been an encouragement to you. For more information and resources by Kingdom Faith and for our other audio and video podcasts, please visit kingdomfaith.com.